Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Axness, because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. And SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. Breeze Eastern. They dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. The Axness PNG Wireless ICS System can bring cutting-edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere, at any time, on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircraft worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axness.com. That's A-X-N-E-S dot com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets, the litters, and of course, the most popular hook in all helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSE will cut bend, sew, weld, and machine these products into existence every day. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at Rescue Gear. That's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. And SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are here to bring your agency up to date with the most current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With the certified flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am one of them, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has also partnered with Petzl to assist with personal protective equipment and the highly specific Lazard. SR3 also goes beyond the helicopter world as they provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com or over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. Up next, again, we've got another U.S. Coast Guard rescue swimmer with incredible stories, crazy awards, plus some rescues that he really remembers. I I just can't get enough of it. I stink and love hearing all of these stories. It's awesome. So please welcome our next guest, United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 387, Mr. Scott Hallway. 
My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. I've got another rescue swimmer with me. Who's more excited than this guy? Well, the guy that's with me. United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 387, Mr. Scott Holloway. What's up, my brother? How you doing, Jason? Dude, I am fantastic. Uh, Thanks for coming on, bro. Man, this is awesome. Stoked. Yeah, me too. I've uh, listened to a lot of your podcasts and um, it's um, an honor to be, you know, part of it. Oh, well, well, thanks, man. I like, I enjoy, I'm just, again, I'm totally stoked. You guys all say yes. <laughs> you know, a couple of them said, no, that's okay. I mean, I'm all about it, you know? Uh, yeah. So it's cool. But uh, you actually, so you and I have, have talked a little bit offline and you've got some killer cases. You've had an incredible career and I'm excited to get into some of these cases. But before I do that, uh, you and I are fellow mass holes along with Labo and Chris Razak and a couple of us that came from a bunch yeah. of mass holes. <laughs> That's Massachusetts for everybody that doesn't know. And we're a bunch of never mind, never mind. <laughs> anyway, so if you don't mind, if you could just introduce yourself, a little bit of background about who you are, where you're from, and how you came into the Coast Guard and how you became a rescue swimmer. Okay. Um, my name is Scott Hallway, um, rescue swimmer 387 uh, from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, I joined the Coast Guard in January of 1984. Um, went to, I actually was an electrician first. And I like, a, a, like an EM? EM, yep. I was on a buoy tender for five years and I actually got out. And then when I came back in, I went uh, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire at um, Station Newcastle. Newcastle. And uh, there we did uh, presidential security for George Bush, the father, which was really, it was so cool doing that, you know? Um, but I, when I came back in, I came back in as a non-rate cause I didn't, that, you know, I couldn't come back as an EM and, you know, it was really a blessing in disguise. And cause when I was in the first time there was, there was no swimmer program. Didn't, didn't know anything about it. So I remember being on watch one day at, um, um, at, at Portsmouth Harbor and we, there was a case going on. There was a boat that had sunk. And remember seeing the 60 come in and yeah. landed on the helo pad. And I ran down, you know, to the, um, to the mess deck and this dude comes in soaking wet in a wetsuit helmet, walks in, gets some coffee, you know, does the hang loose thing and walks out. And I'm like, who the hell was that? <laughs> you know, that's what I want to do. And from that then on, I initially put my name on the E, the AE school list or the eight, the electrician at the time, yep. I think it was AE. And then after I saw that, I went right down to the office. I said, I want to go to ASM school. And then that was it. Yeah. Yeah. It so, takes one guy. Oh, wait, I wish yeah. we knew who it was that was there. I know that was the defining moment, you know, that made me want to, um, to, to become a rescue swimmer. It was pretty cool. So. That's right. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> yep. And then it went to, um, went to, I think, waited two and a half years or so, maybe, maybe longer. And then um, graduated, I think it was 94, um, Brett with Brad Treblehorn and um, Munsell, Nelson Munsell. He, he had got out and a guy named Sean Sims. And I was down there with Rich Chambers and John Hall and a bunch of guys. Yeah. And I went, to Kate, went to Kate May. And that, that was, um, that was my first unit. Uh, Tom Cow was the senior chief. Um, Kirk Makovic, Rich Gladys, Sean Mogan, Scott Harris, all those good guys. Nice. So learning from those guys, it was like invaluable being a station with those guys. And what year was that again? 94. Um, I think November of 94, I believe it was. Were you there through 97 by chance? Yeah, I, I closed it down, yeah. Oh, nice. So – kind of side story you and i cross paths uh, sort of i was actually in boot camp when you guys were still standing duty and i remember like 
being a little boot, hut, 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 well, you know, walking and watching the 65 take off. And I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. I don't care how to get in the, I want to be in the aircraft. And then they do this little video at boot camp. They're like, hey, do exercises and you could jump out of a helicopter. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> so that Janet, was a lot of you guys. Janet Jeff actually came over and worked with us for a week. And oh, no was, kidding. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Dang, yeah. that's awesome. Nice. Well, that's pretty it gnarly. Great duty station, though. It was the best kept secret in the Coast Guard. It really was. Yeah. It was, it was a shame that they closed the place down. I mean, Atlantic City was great, too, because they um, built a new air station in Atlantic City, and we moved up there. And, uh, right. Brought New York great. down. Keep May yeah. up. Yeah. 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 And now there's so, Opvax or have debts, whatever you want to call it. A north and south um, ready crew. Yeah. City. Um, that's where I met Harold Hoffmaster very good friend of mine guys nice. super good guy worked with him at the cape i mean super guy nice very nice all right so well you uh you and i actually talked a little bit about your very first case and your very first case was kind of a it was a good one <laughs> yeah it was i was um yeah we it was so there was a i think a 65 foot um eastern rig boat um, taking on water about 65 miles. East Actually, of- it would be a 75 foot according yeah. to the award. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell so, you what, before you get into it, let me read this and, uh, okay. and then, right. and then, yeah, just break it down for us. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Citation to accompany the award of the Coast Guard Achievement Medal to Scott Holloway, Aviation Survivalman, third class United States Coast Guard. Vanessa Holloway is cited for superior performance of duty while serving as rescue swimmer aboard Coast Guard H-65 Helicopter 6576 on the morning of 7 January 1995. The aircraft was launched with 600-foot ceilings, 35-knot winds, and two-mile visibility in haze to locate a 75-foot eastern rig trawler, Pilgrim Progress, taken on water 65 miles east of Cape May, New Jersey. Once on scene, the vessel's master decided to have the crew abandon ship, and the three attempts were made to deliver Petty Officer Holloway to the vessel to aid the recovery. However, the vast amount of rigging coupled with the violent pitching of the vessel made a direct hoist impossible. Shortly thereafter, the vessel's raft drifted off, the engines failed, and the communications were lost with the helpless four-man crew. Petty Officer Holloway was then deployed to the water. Despite the 40-degree water and the 10-foot swells, he coaxed each survivor into the water, away from the sinking vessel, and then into the awaiting rescue basket. The last crew member had not zipped his survival suit prior to entering the frigid water. This caused the man to quickly become unresponsive and unable to swim or assist Pastor Holloway in his rescue. Through great strength and skill, Pedestra Holloway managed to secure the man in the basket where he also was hoisted to safety. Pedestra Holloway's diligence, perseverance, and devotion and duty are most heartily commending in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Scott, that's the case number one. That is sick. <laughs> yeah, I... Um... I just remember getting launched. Uh, the duty room in Cape May was like, I think the darkest place on the planet. So you couldn't move and do anything until the watch captain got up and opened the door. So we're all just sitting there, the whoopies going off and, you know, Jerry, I think it was Jerry Garriott was the uh, guy, uh, um, the watch captain at the time finally cracked the door. Then we all got up and um, we launched and, you know, I didn't really think anything of it, honestly. And uh, Mark Samiego was a flight mech. And oh my gosh, I know Mark San Diego. Good guy. Yeah. Him and yeah. I were stationed together in, in uh Humboldt Bay. Super okay. good dude. He's a good guy. Yeah. Uh haven't hadn't seen him in years. But um I remember they put two, I think they put two pumps on board and still didn't really think anything of it. Had my dry suit on, Sawan, all that stuff. And we flew out there and we found him. And um, you know, you're not really thinking, you know, well, we're just gonna hoist them. And um, next thing you know. They, you know, the power on the boat, get, um, the engine quit and the pumps couldn't keep up. And next thing you know, the, you know, Mark opens the door and he kicks the pumps out. I'm like, what the hell's going on? 
And then, you know, they tried to lower me down and then they brought me back up. They're like, well, you're going to the water. I'm like, man, this is happening. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, swimming over to the boat and the first three people jumped off. No problem. And I was able to, you know, bring them over to the basket and they bring them up, you know, one by one. But the last guy was a captain. And the reason why his um, suit wouldn't zip up is because, you know, he was too, too big for it. Ah. So when he jumped in, first he wouldn't jump off. And I had to, you know, you know, I was swearing at him and everything. I'm like, you know, if, if you don't jump off, you know, you're going to die. And he, he ended up jumping off and he jumped right on top of me and then um, swam over to the basket. And when I was putting him in the basket, he grabbed onto the bales and he was laying across the basket width wise. Yeah. Instead of getting in it. Yeah. And I could not. Everything that I did, I was punching him, you know, punching his hands, punching everything to get him to to let go of the bale so I could get him in the basket. And he just would not would not let go. And the next thing you know, Mark just hoisted him up just like that. And I was praying to God. I'm like, please, God, don't let this guy fall. And he ended up, you know, staying on the basket and, um, and you know, it was, it was a successful hoist. And then they got me and. Um, that was it. We flew in and it was strange though, because it was right at shift change and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, thank God John Hall came in the next day. He's like, okay, we got to, you know, get these guys, you know, some surviving gear and, you know, ambulance came over and I had no idea, you know, I was, it, it, it wasn't until afterwards when I started thinking about it, I started, I'm, I'm like, Oh, that just happened, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, my it was a hell of a first case, you know, but, you know, I know some guys get like flare sightings and stuff like that, but I, um, I, I was pretty, pretty fortunate to get something like that for the first one. So, but you know how it is, you know, you can go years after that without anything right. which really happened, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to being a swimmer. <laughs> I know. Huh? Holy smoke. Dude, that's awesome. All right. So now like that is like giving you the bug. Like there's yeah. no doubt. It was like, okay, oh, I'm cool. ready for the next one. You know, how, you, know, you know how it is when somebody in the shop gets a good case, it's like, oh yeah, let's go. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready for another one. Then, you know, then nothing happens and nothing happens. So yeah. You get a little bit of complacency in and you're like, okay, yeah. going yeah. through the motions, going yeah. through my day. Whoopi goes off. And you're like, oh, oh, flare sighting. You're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. So now um, you have a couple more uh, awards, but before I get into those, I'm all about if you have any other ones that kind of stand out to you in between each of them. Um, when I, we were up in Atlantic City, um, we got this call that there was a, um, down in Cape, uh, Wildwood, this guy was overdue on a little 12 foot boat. And what happened to him is he was out, you know, just right in the ocean and his boat flipped over. He had a life jacket on. He died of hypothermia. Right. So, you know how, when you're laying back, your arms float up to the surface, right. It was laid back in kind of like a re reclined position and, rigor mortis set in then he floats into the um into to the marsh area then the tide went out so you know so we're out searching me and a guy named troy callback troy was the um flight mech and we're flying around flying around so the pilots decided to go into the marsh area and then we looked down and there he was he was right in the middle of the in the middle of the marsh so they lowered me troy lowered me down onto the, the grassy part. And when I jumped in, I wasn't thinking. I sank right up to almost my chest into the mud. <laughs> I was like, I was actually um, pretty scared for a little bit because I'm like, you know, the tide's going to come up because the more I moved, the more I sunk down. Oh, <laughs> so, so I probably ended up lowering the hook and they just freaking, you know, I hooked up to my, um, I think we had tri size at the time. Yeah, hooked up to the trisar and just ripped me right out. And then um, we ended up doing the um, I don't know if you I don't know if they still do it or not, but you uh, use the um, the strop 
the, we did a direct deployment with a strop and then yep. I did the, um, the, the quick strop and then a strop around his legs. Like, when oh the, yeah, the hypothermic, the hypothermic lift. lift. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how, that's how we brought him up, but his arms were straight out and <laughs> up in the air and I couldn't move them and full of I don't of mean mud. to laugh. That's just, no, no. Funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> full of mud. You know, we, we got him inside and there was mud everywhere. The guy's freaking eyes were open and, um, we ended up taking him to Burdett Tomlin Hospital because where else are we going to take him? And they were kind of ticked off at us that we brought him there. I'm like, where the hell else are we supposed to bring him? So, I mean, because this guy was stiff as a board. His arms are sticking straight up in the air like he was getting ready to hug you. And um, <laughs> nurses were upset. And I'm like, well, sorry. Yeah. But mud everywhere. It was it was disgusting. <laughs> so. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> So the uh, the hypothermic lift that you're talking about, I, great move. Um, it basically, you have the quick strap that goes around. So I'm sorry, the the regular strap that goes around the chest, and then the quick strap would go around underneath your knees, and you basically you sit in like a a reclined position, and it's it's an awesome position, a, a great hoisting. And, and the reason they came up with that was to instead of going vertical, so all the blood leave, the warm blood left your chest goes into your legs and then you put somebody in cardiac arrest. Yeah. It was a way to prevent that. Great move. Yeah, so, I didn't want to, I didn't want him in my face. So that's why I decided to do the hypothermic lift, even though- Super smart. So yeah. I didn't want him in my face, but- <laughs> Tools in the toolbox, man. I'm, I'm all yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I was a little, I was a little um, nervous a little bit because I, when I, when I first jumped in, like, like an idiot, I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this guy. And I jumped in and I sunk right down. Init uh, it was initially up to my waist, but the more I moved down, I got up to about my chest and I'm like, you know, looking up and I'm like, you know, signaling for the hook. And he finally brought the hook down and they just ripped me right out. So, and then they put me down on top of them. You know, we went back up and I get the, the slings and uh, the strop and went right back down and we were able to pick them up. Recover. So this is kind of a good discussion point because I, I, I mean, I've been in mud and muck and mire, like, you know, up to my, probably my, uh, not quite my knees, but you know, you, you start getting that suction. Yeah. Like yeah. you don't, it's one of those things you don't really think about when you're getting hoisted in. So it's pretty powerful. It, 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 it keeps you down. It really does. I, um, like I said, I was, I was kind of concerned. I was getting more concerned because I, the more I moved, the more I would go down, the more I'd go down. And uh, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to get out of there if they didn't, if, the, if they didn't get me out of there, I, you know, the tide would have come up and I would have been, it would have been done. But, um, wow. so, but you know, of course they weren't going to let that happen, but yeah, it was cool though, because they set the hook down and just <laughs> ripped me right out. <laughs> <laughs> I left my boot. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang man. Wow. That's uh that's definitely a memorable story for sure. Holy cow. All right. So now let me get into Unless you got another one, I'll get I'll get into this this case right here because this is pretty pretty something this is something else right here. So you want me to get into this one? The Cape Cod one? Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, here we go. Next award uh for Scott Holloway. Citation to accompany the award of the air medal to AST1, Scott J. Holloway, United States Coast Guard. Pastor Holloway is cited for meritorious achievement in aerial flight while serving as rescue swimmer aboard H-60J helicopter 6042 out of Coast Guard Air Station Cape Cod during the rescue of two crew members aboard a sailing vessel, Moonlight Contessa, on 14 November 2003. Pastor Holloway and his crew responded to a distress call from a sailing vessel which was disabled in 35-foot seas approximately 250 nautical miles southeast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Descending through heavy cloud layer to reach the stricken vessel, the aircraft rapidly began accumulating ice in the frigid temperatures. Lacking sufficient power to climb back out of the icing conditions due to the weight of the inch-thick ice, the crew was forced to accept the descent rate with the hope that the ice would shed at lower altitudes, thereby providing sufficient power to stop their descent prior to impacting the water. After several tense minutes, the ice began to shed and the crew leveled off and arrived on scene, finding the sailing vessel being violently tossed by mountainous waves and 55 knot wind gusts. 
with the mast broken. The vessel was completely helpless. And it was uncontrolled pitching and rolling made it made a direct deployment from the deck extremely dangerous. The air crew quickly made a difficult decision to order the survivors to abandon ship so that they could be hoisted from the water. Pedersen Holloway immediately volunteered to deploy into the towering waves. Upon being lowered beneath the aircraft, he was immediately blown back toward the tail rotor by the howling winds. Overcoming this, he entered the enormous cresting waves and began to swim to the survivor. Battling a huge wave and fierce wind, he struggled to keep the survivor on the surface while preparing him to be hoisted. Pedersen Holloway then fought through the breaking wave crest to position himself and the survivor to be hoisted to the aircraft. As they were raised out of the water, gusting winds blew them back once again. Nearing the aircraft, they were consistently blown back to the aircraft's fuselage aft of the cabin door. After monumental struggle, Pedersen Holloway grasped, grasped the edge of the door and with a flight mech's assistant, pulled himself and the survivor into the aircraft. Without pausing to catch his breath, he immediately deployed back into the mountainous seas to repeat the entire process for the second survivor. Pedersen Holloway demonstrated remarkable initiative, daring, and exceptional fortitude in the face of impending personal danger. His courage... Judgment and devotion to duty are most heartily commending in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Bro, 35 foot waves, 55 knot winds. What? <laughs> you know, we did we did a direct deployment. So it, you know, so they, they made it sound a lot harder than it really was. So I mean, oh, way to downplay it. Come on, man. <laughs> All right. So I have been in 30 foot seas. That is a mountain of a wave. Like you're swimming uphill and you're sliding downhill. It's yeah, you're not gonna. There's no way that you're gonna keep your eye on the survivor. So you you have to do a direct deployment and 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 seas like that. You know. Yeah. I mean, there, there was there's no other way to do it. So I mean, I it, it was it was a no brainer. But I know we we actually took off when we took off from Air Station Cape Cod. We actually had like a maybe a 15, 20 minute flight and we went landed in Nantucket. We actually topped off because, you know, we knew fuel was going to be an issue because the, because of the 50, it was a 55 knot tail one going out. It took us about an hour and a half to get out there, but you know, three hours to get back. Right. Um, yeah. We did have that, that ice and issue was, it was very much a concern and it was weird though, because I, it was uh, Mr. Warren was the, um, pilot rob Dinell was the co-pilot and chris davis was the flight mechanic he was a big dude just like claude morrissey big big freaking big guy i know chris as well you know, him and i were in the honor guard together good guy man really super good, good dude so we were flying out there and then uh, we were up about eight thousand feet and when they started to descend to start the approach that's when we iced up and you could, you could tell, I mean, right away, you know, it got dark in the helicopter and then just, you could just tell that with, with a winding, the whining sound was what, you know, of the engines and everything was different. And then, um, Mr. Moran's like, look, um, we can't climb back up. We have to accept this descent and we got to pray to God that we stretch, you know, shed this ice. And he's telling me, you know, cause you know how this, you know, the swimmer, we ran the radios. Right. Right. He's like, Okay, when we get to this amount of feet, he said, Scott, I want you to get off of Mayday, get a really good position. We're going to impact the water. We're, you know, he went through the whole egress thing, meet in the front of the helicopter. Wow. And then at that point, it's you get like the tunnel vision and can't hear that well. And Chris is like, look at, he's grabbed me by the arm. He's looking at me. He's like, I'm like, all right, just chill out. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. And then, you know, luckily... Um, after a few minutes, we, we got low enough and we shed the ice. But one thing that didn't say either was, um, it was so cold that the, um, we weren't able to transfer fuel because I think one of the lines froze up. So that was an issue too. Oh my but God. That ended, that ended up working itself out too. I think when, you know, cause we got, I don't know, we got low enough where the, where the temperature was warm enough. So, so we were able to end up, you know, transferring the, 
the, the fuel from the externals to the mains. So, so yeah, it was, it was, it was tense, you know, I mean, the rest of the rest of the, the rescue was, you know, pretty, pretty easy, really, you know, but they made, um, they made it sound like, you know, I did all the work getting them in the cabin, but Chris, you know, how big Chris was, Oh, he's a, you know, you know, not Chris not is like, like six foot four, 220 pounds of solid muscle a monster. Yeah. Dude, he's a beast. <laughs> yeah. So we, he, he got us, he got us, you know, when we got up to the door, I didn't do anything. He grabbed me right by the freaking harness so that, and, and just, or, or whatever. And it just ripped us right in the cabin. So yeah, it, it wasn't me. It, it was all him that did that. Um, oh, that's awesome. Come on, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. That, yeah. wow. The, yeah, you know, but the, yeah, yeah. The, the, the 35 foot seas, I mean, you, you can't, you can't free swim in 35 foot seas. You know, you can't, there's no way you can keep your eye on the survivor. No. Not at all. So, no. but. Wow. So for everybody's knowledge, the H60, the Jayhawk that the Coast Guard used, they do have a de-ice capability on the on the blades. So when they kick it on, the whole front edge, uh, front edge of the blade actually heats up and will shed the weight. So the fact that they froze up so much that either A, that couldn't keep up or the rest of the aircraft got so heavy that it couldn't hold lift, that's that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it was weird, though, because, uh, you know, the uh, like I said, the whole – the whole el you know helicopter froze up and um, iced up and you couldn't even see out the window, so it got really dark inside too. So it was just just it was really weird, you know. I, I never wanted to experience that again. So, but That's um, wild. yeah, but uh, Mr. Warren did a great job uh, flying, and um, Chris was just the way he ripped us in. But yeah, we did get blown back pretty far, you know, to the. I mean, not dangerous, but pretty, pretty close to the tail, tail rotor, you know, uh, towards the tail more than anything. And then yeah. back and forth a couple of times, you know, um, I could see the freaking uh, pilot, you know, on the other side, you know, from down below. So, but it was, it was, um, yeah, like I said, the 55 knot wind um, headwind made, you know, gave us a three hour uh, flight on the way in. So, um, geez, oh man hour getting out three hours getting back in yeah, it's crazy Ooh crazy but yeah it was luckily there was only two people we didn't really have a lot of time but we had the falcon you know flying over cover for us and radios so <laughs> brother that is gnarly yeah, wow God. yeah it was really good um really good bunch of guys at cape cod like i said harold hoffmaster alaricchio um Claude Morrissey, he's he's another another big goofy monster. <laughs> <laughs> totally is. Yeah, he is. I love Claude. <laughs> great guy. Oh man! All right, my friend. Well, what happened in between that case and then your next award case, which is a big one? Actually, um, I think we had we had another um, we had another case. It was actually a year later. Me and Chris again. There was a, I forgot about, there's a moonlight, uh, not the moonlight, the Canadian mist. It was a lobster boat about 60 miles east of Nantucket. And that thing sank. And we went out and sure enough, there was a life raft right out there. And it was like maybe 10, 15 foot seas. And Chris, again, was the flight mechanic, thank God. And, um, you know, I'm like, here we are, Chris. And there's a raft. And we look at, I jumped down, look inside. And there they are. I actually was able to, I said, let's do direct deployment. They're like, no, we're going to, you're going to free swim this time. <laughs> well, I think there was five guys in that raft and um, we, were, we were able to um, get those five guys and fly back to the Cape, but they were uh, a lobster boat out of um, somewhere out of Maine. So. Oh man. Wow. Pretty nonchalant, easy, like kind of run us through. Cause there's a lot of people that, that do, like the, for those of us that do the job, you know, you come up to the raft, you pop up, Hey, everybody. Okay. And, and yeah. You know, um, but after that, so for everybody that doesn't understand or know what we do, what did you do when you got up to the raft? Just w swam up to it, told them who I was, what we were going to do, took them out one by one. And after everything was said and done, take my trusty knife out and 
pop the raft. Scuttle the raft. Was anybody? Uh, was everybody okay in the inside of the raft? Yeah. Like, yeah, everybody was fine. Yeah, uh, they, they, they. It was funny though. They played the the mayday for us, and the guy was like, "Coast Guard, Coast Guard, Coast Guard." What's whole <laughs> fishing vessel? Um, Canadian Mist. Uh, we're, we're going down, and that was it. Off, he gave the Latin long. He said, "We're going down," and that was it. That, that, and then, yeah, oh. I think um, uh, Senator Snow, uh, not Snow, um, Collins made a phone call to the air station to thanks, thank us. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Senator, yeah. <laughs> right on. That's pretty awesome. Nice. Another five live saved. Well done, sir. You and your crew. You know, this means I need to call Chris too, just to verify all these stories. Oh, I'm yeah. Just, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Come on, bro. <laughs> he, actually, he lives on the Cape too. Oh, so now I got a, I got a reason to go down there. Another reason to go down there. Yeah. That's two reasons. Um, what that? He lives up in um, near the bridge somewhere. Oh, okay. We, he works for a Department of Human Services, like a child, and he does works with the children, you know, the troubled teens and stuff. Yeah, well, loaded, loaded with tattoos. He's loaded with tattoos now. Um, really good guy. Of course he is. Really great guy. But strong, strong as an ox. Yeah. 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 He was able to rip me in the cabin pretty easy. <laughs> with, with those guys. Yeah. You know, unlike um, the uh, sixty-five, you know, you can boom that thing in. Right. Oh, the sixty. That that hoist uh, just stays where it is. Yep. And you, yeah, it's it's a muscle. It's it's literally muscling people in dang man i just say i just love the six i love flying on the 60 that thing is just such a superior helicopter yeah oh you and me both yeah i it's it's um so i've been underneath quite a few helicopters and being underneath a 60 that rotor wash is something else like yeah and it's hard to explain the you know like the 139 kicks out really good rotor wash i i and not being under the 225 or the S92, I know that has some good rotor wash, but mm-hmm. just recently being underneath the uh, uh, the AV109, basically the, the 46 twin rotor head, and it, I was like, wow, the 60 feels worse. <laughs> I remember the first time being on the 60, we did a max power takeoff, and we went from like zero to 250 feet in like seconds to pilot just ripped the collector right up to his armpit and we just went right up and it was pinned, yes. right, down, pinned right down to the seat i'm like hey can we do that again <laughs> oh that is awesome <laughs> yeah. i mean this is nice. a good helicopter but yeah I mean, the 60 by fire is just a superior helicopter it really is totally oh sick i love it all right i'm gonna i'm gonna keep moving forward uh because you like i said you got another Really nice award, and it, you were part of it uh, down there in Hurricane Katrina. So I'm going to read this, and, and then, yeah, just another visual story or another guy, another set of stories out of Hurricane Katrina. And there are so many of you guys that have such incredible stories down there. Um, yeah, I'm excited to hear what, what happened with you. So citation to accompany the award of the Air Medal. Gold star in lieu of second to AST-1 Scott J. Holloway, United States Coast Guard. Pastor Holloway is cited for heroic achievement in aerial flight from 31 August 2005 to 6 September 2005 while serving as rescue swimmer aboard Coast Guard HH-60J helicopters operating in support of search and rescue operations in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall on the Gulf Coast with 145 mile an hour sustained winds and torrential rainfall, causing widespread devastation in four states, consecutive extensive flooding containing toxic contaminants, and the stranding of over 100,000 residents. With unselfish regard for his own personal safety, Pastor Holloway flawlessly executed four mass evacuation stories while constantly engaging in exceptional, dangerous operating conditions. Pastor Holloway routinely deployed down to treacherous rooftop areas containing a large number of desperate survivors. During single rescue swimmer operations, he was able to deftly triage large groups of dehydrated, starving, and irate survivors, 
ensuring that most critical were evacuated first. Pastor Holloway demonstrated remarkable initiative throughout the difficult and unfamiliar rescue operations, deploying with a power saw and a, and a fire ax. He demonstrated remarkable strength by cutting his way into homes that were otherwise inaccessible. He operated this equipment while maneuvering on steeply slanted rooftops amid scores of power lines and other obstacles and underneath a hovering helicopter producing intense downwash. Upon returning to ATC Mobile, he quickly shared his knowledge with other rescue swimmers, which greatly improved the overall efficiency of the rescue operations. He was consumed professionally throughout his entire operation, treating each and every survivor with respect and compassion under the duress of, this condi of these conditions. Pastor Holloway's actions, skills, were instrumental in the rescue of 225 lives. His courage, judgment, and devotion to duty are most heartily commending and keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Bro, like I know Katrina was gnarly, but 225 lives, sick. Well done, sir. Yeah, you know, the one thing I can say about um, Hurricane Katrina was standardization. I'm sure you've heard it you know, many times, many, many times. And I will mm -hmm. preach it all day long. Standard, 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 make everything standard. hundred percent. You know, I, um, didn't know my pilots. Um, my first, my first two flights I flew down there, I ended up, it was, I, I kind of got, uh, I was pretty fortunate because me and Brett Durham, I don't know if you met Brett. Um, <clears throat> we, we were, um, he was, he's Not a swimmer sure. in Clearwater for a while, but yeah. him and I flew twice together. And then we had um, Ronnie Jester as our flight mech. He was on the stand team. That guy was great, great flight mech. So we, I don't know how I did it, but my first two flights, you know, two days in a row, I flew with those guys. And um, I just remember flying down the first day. I'm like, is there going to be anything left for us or what? Is this going to be a waste of time? And Brett's like, just wait. I'm like, because he had already <laughs> flown one flight down there. I'm like, come on, what's it like? He goes, just wait. And as we got closer, <laughs> then you could see the devastation. And I remember pulling into a hover in this neighborhood, and everywhere you looked, you could see, you know, orange or, you know, white and white, you know, Coast Guard helicopters and doing the same thing as, as we were doing, just getting lowered down and, you know, just get to work. It was so overwhelming. It's like, where do you start? And then the pilots like, oh, just going to start right here. And then me and, me and Brett would just tag team just down back and forth we, as many people as we could you know wow. and you know we did the the axe thing for a while and then we ended up getting a chainsaw and um um i was able to be you know be the use the the first guy to use the chainsaw and it made nice. it so, so much easier I had jerry huber gave me crap about that he's like i walk in the shop he's like this chainsaw hallway <laughs> but yeah but yeah jerry's a good guy but um yeah, it, it just it just made it so much more easier using the chainsaw. I, mean, I think it was uh, Joel Sayers was the first one to to use a I think use a, an axe to to cut cut people out of the roof. But but the, you know, just like the citation said, people were pretty irate, you know, because they were, you know, you, you you hoist people and then you you know, I think at one point we had like twenty people on on the sixty. We'd fly to the Cloverleaf and drop them off and come back and you know you don't remember you can't remember where you came so you're literally you know separating families but it was just constant constant you know flying and hoisting and you know i mean i hate to say it but it was a really good time you know i mean it yeah. was like super bowl sr yeah just like yeah. everybody says you know yeah i it's funny you you make that comment like it was a good time for us, it was a great time. Like all yeah. of us swimmers, that's what we lived for. It was the devastation and the heartache that it cost everybody else to had to go through it, you know, yeah. separated families, loss of homes and properties. Yeah. And like, I get it. And, and my, my empathy, my sympathy for everybody that lost everything, but this is what we stand by to do. And this is our, this is our calling. Yeah. You train yeah. all the time for this. And, um, and it's like, this was the culmination of, you know, all the training you did. And it's like, yeah. you know, smashing windows out and balconies, you know, railings out to, 
you know, to make the hoisting e easier, you know, just, you know, if we were just going to use the basket or, I mean, um, there was, there was some challenge and stuff, but I mean, everybody, you know, everybody was able to pull it off, you know? Yeah. Um, I will, I will, I'm going to embarrass Harold Hoffmaster on this one, but. Oh, I'm so excited. Come on. You know well, why? Cause he was already here and he can't defend yeah, himself. <laughs> so it was after, I think my second, my second, um, after my second day, he ended up flying down and he was going to go to New Orleans, I think it was. And I, sh I, I go back to my hotel room and I open the door and who's in my hotel room, but Harold Hoffmaster in his one bed. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, seriously. He's like, well, this is the room they gave me. I'm like, well, what are we going to do? So we ended up taking the comforter, rolling it up, put it in the middle and we, we talk about uh, the, the, this is the time that we shall never speak of. So, <laughs> and now it's known. You yep. know, what? I won't tell anyone either. Okay. No. <laughs> no touching, no touching. But I, or I need to be the big spoon. <laughs> if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't probably wouldn't have been down there either. So, oh my gosh. Side story. I'll tell you, I'll tell you when we're offline about that one. So, okay. All right. <laughs> So. Sorry, everybody. You don't get to hear that part of it. <laughs> wow. Scott, those are crazy. That That's, yeah, I I get it, New Orleans, you know, and again, that whole, the whole side of us and just, it was a good time for all of us swimmers, you yeah. know, all of you swimmers, I'll say you guys that went down there, but the way I look at it is, you know, the guys, let's, let's bring it back to the guys that was in the raft from the, uh, the, the lobster boat, you know, that's a bad day for them. They lost everything. They lost, you lost the whole boat. You know, you got five guys in the raft you pick up. That's a bad day for them. But for us, man, that's what we trained to do. I'm like, let's go to the water. Let's go get them. So, yeah. Yeah, that, you, know. That, you know, that's what you train hardcore. You go through school and, you know, you know, that, that's what you, that's what you're trained to do. And no. I, I mean, I, I hate like hell to say we, it was fun, but, you know, because of all the devastation, but it was, you know, it was fun. <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. God, I, I wish I'd been down there with you guys. I really it was do. It so cool, too, because, you know, there was so many swimmers in the shop, and it's like, oh, okay, you're him. Okay, you're him. You know, meeting all these people. And, yeah. And it's like, okay, if you put up, if you don't meet them in research, then you, it's like, okay, I know who this guy, I know who, who you are now. Yep. And, yeah sick man that's awesome now that uh that actually kind of wrapped up a bit of your coast guard career so yeah. i mean you 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 had an amazing career in the coast guard and then it didn't stop there because you went into law enforcement so i did i did i i went on terminal leave and um, i started the police academy I, I think i left on friday and um started the academy on a monday and um it was excellent because all the guys in the swimmer shop came to my graduation. Harold brought all the guys and, you know, they were up in the stands and it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, it was such a great brotherhood. And Hooting and hollering when you're walking down to the get your badge. Stuff, the, the swimmer guys, the, the, that, that, the coast guy was the, the greatest brotherhood, you know, not so much the police. It was, it was totally different, you know, yep. but, um, you know, but the, 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 the Coast Guard, you know, guys, they, they were there. They sported me, and um, it, it was it was really cool seeing them there. That's awesome. Yeah, a bunch of classy guys. So, so yeah. Man, man. yeah. So I'm glad I'm done with I'm glad I'm done with the policing thing now. Yeah. <laughs> not, not a good um, time to be a police officer in this country. So. No, no, it's not. And rumor has it there's a lot of uh, paperwork. Oops. Oh my god. <laughs> Come on, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of paperwork. Oh, that's funny. Nice. Um, well, I'll tell you what, man. You've shared some amazing stories with us, and I, I can't thank you enough. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up to you, you know, like stuff that you'd like to pass on to younger generation, stuff like the floor is open, my friends. What do you got? Uh, what I'd say to the younger generation of guys coming up, um, just enjoy it. 
enjoy it while you're in it because it goes by so fast. And then next thing you know, you're an older guy on the outside looking in, wishing, wishing he was still there. I mean, it was uh, the greatest job I ever had. And I just, I just say, enjoy it. Enjoy it while you're there. You know, I, like I said, I, we talked about, I watched the, um, you know, like when a new class graduates, I'll watch the YouTube videos and um, it's, it's like the school from when I went through to what it's like now, it's like being at a CrossFit gym, right? You know? Like which you and I talked about CrossFit. <laughs> I mean, that was, you know, I love CrossFit. It actually, you know, when I, when I get out, when I finished the Coast Guard, I pretty much stopped working out for a long time. And then I get to the point where I got to do something. And, um, the, the gym that I'm at now guy just opened up and like walking to work one day and he had faxed the police station, uh, you know, police special. And I went, took the tour, um, took a, um, beginner class, absolutely hated it. And then I signed up the next day and I've been doing it for eight years now. <laughs> <laughs> hated the beginner class and I'm, I'm I, back. Ab- absolutely hated yeah. it. And then, then, then I'm like the next day, I'm like, all right, I'm, 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 I'm in. So, but we had, he, I, he's supposed to be in the beginning of class for four weeks. And at the time the coach, you know, I, I said, let me stay another week. She's like, no, this is, this is it, you know, and, but she let me stay like one more class. And I'm like, please let me just stay in the beginning of class. And she's like, nope, I'm going to let you stay today, but tomorrow you're going into the regular class and <laughs> so scared. And, but when I went into the regular class, I'm like, well, this ain't too bad. So. So at, there's, there's something about like the CrossFit side of things, you know, and it, actually let yeah. me get back to, I agree with you. Everybody that's in and doing this job, embrace it and love it for what it is. It is an amazing job and or ride it, ride it until the wheels fall off. That's right. Absolutely. I had wish I stayed in for 30. I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I wish I stayed in longer. Yeah. So, but you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, and, and, and when I retired, I didn't, I didn't leave because I thought it sucked. I just saw another, uh, there was another opportunity and I'm like, okay, 20 years is good. And yeah. I also, I also, you know, believed in, you know, you know what I did my, I did my time. If I retire, somebody else is going to make first. Yeah. And, and that's what happened. Brian Doolittle was able to. Oh, nice. First class. Yeah. When, when yeah. my retirement letter went and he actually called me at the Cape said, Hey, I heard you're retiring. I'm like, yep. He goes, I'm going to be able to make first now. I'm like, good for you, Brian. Yeah. That's awesome. Brian, well, Brian, good guy. Bob Florisi made first when I got out. Hey, Brian. took my spot. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Love the guy. Yeah. So man, that's awesome. Yeah. I same thing. I, like, I, when I got out opportunities, presented themselves and i took them and and i've traveled the world and worked on a lot of helicopters and yeah i've had a blast and heck now i get to talk to you guys about all of our war stories yeah yeah <laughs> so cool it's so cool so, you know listening to the old guys too the older guys when the program first came out and you know kudos goes to um when i went to school there was um mike pascal who i'm still afraid of to this day the red booties um joe gibson lou Britt. um Thor Wentz, those guys were unbelievable. I hate call, I hate using their first names because I feel like I'm being disrespectful to other guys. I absolutely revered those guys. They're awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I only knew Thor in uh, in EMT. School. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's the same thing there. Gosh, great guys. Yeah. Great guy. But, uh, now let me let me circle back to the the whole CrossFit thing because again, I, I'm a big CrossFit. I I love. I love it. And I, I got to give a little kudos to Kurt Revels because he actually kind of drove me a little bit further. And then randomly, my wife was like, hey, I want to go to the gym. And it's like, I want to do the workout with you. I was like, well, OK, we'll go here. And next thing you know, her and I are, are jamming, which is what I love. But one of the things that I, I love about CrossFit as much as not only is it a good workout with the high intensity, but it mimics a lot of the movements that we need to do as rescuemen. You know, so it's like every pull up you do, every push up you do, every clean you do, every squat you do, every overhead press is something related to something we've done on a mission, whether it's, you know, whatever. And, and it's, it's, I love it. I mean, that's, it's all everyday yeah. functional movements. Yeah. That's what I like. Yeah. It's so functional. You know, I mean, there's some stuff that we do 
you know, lately, like we do, we've been doing curls and stuff, but for the most part, we do all the, you know, the squats and, you know, yeah. overhead and back squats, front squats and bench pressing and all that stuff. It's just everyday functional stuff. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I love, love the, the, um, Olympic weightlifting. It's so, Oh, it's totally, you know, the older you get, the, the more you have to get put weightlifting into your, you know, weight training into your, you know, your, your exercise regimen, or you're going to, you know, you're going to lose muscle and get yeah. fat. And so, but I'm yeah, still wor- I'm still working on my snatch. I'm, I'm not very good at it. Yeah. My we overhead just did, squat sucks. We did that the other day. <laughs> we just did our one, one rep, but we, um, he gives us like 20 minutes to find out one, one, you know, max rep of things. And we just did the snatch the other day. So nice. Very nice. The, the other thing that I compare like the whole CrossFit high intensity workout, it, it's uh, especially when you get into a group. So like you and I get together and, and we go do the workout of the day. And it's, it's like that you're back into the shop and school and yep. you know, you're, you're driving yourself to the point of exhaustion where you you're like laying on the floor at the end of it, like, Oh my God, but you're doing it together. And that's what I think the majority of us, why we love it so much, because it's that internal yeah. pain that, that we love to embrace. And then when you you're know, done, you're like, yeah. You know, I, I, I say to people all the time, I'm like, I dare you to show me. We'll take, we'll go year for year. Show me how many times you go to the gym and, you know, and, and I mean, I go five, six days a week, you know, yep. we, we don't do it on Sundays cause he's needs a day off. But, <laughs> but, and the thing that I like the most about it too, is it's like, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do. Like when I go into, if I went to a regular gym, it's like, okay, I got to jump on the stair climber and then I'll do benching today and curling. I don't have to worry about that. It's everything's ready for me because I'm lazy like that. I can't figure that out. <laughs> so I pay somebody good money to tell me what I'm going to do. Yeah. And then I know at the end of that work, at the end of that one hour, I'm going to be laying down in a puddle of freaking sweat <laughs> because I could never, ever push myself like, we push each other right. and it's a great community too. They're like, Oh, you guys are a cult. It's like, well, I guess we are. Yeah. I don't care. Culture. Culture. Yeah. Culture. Yeah. We all go out to the, and down here, you know, we go out to the, um, take our Jeeps out to the beach on Sundays and we all hang out together and have a great time. Awesome. You know? It's a great community too. Yeah. You know, a bunch of us hang out half, you know, just not in the gym. It's Yeah. And that's us too, like down here. And it, yeah. that's where like the swimmer shop and being in that, that world, it's, it, I, I'm not going to say it's a mirror image, but it, it is very uh, similar to what we used to have. So you have that community and you can embrace you, know you in it's, the same. You bring up a good point because I, I never, I never put that connection there. That, that's one of the reasons why I like it so much. And I, I never, never put that connection there. Yeah. You're, you're, Everybody you're, is suffering together. Yeah. <laughs> right on point with that. I, I never looked at it like that. Yeah. Wow. And then when you're done, so that's one of the other things like, all right, so we we're right on the beach as well. So some of our workouts we have done have been like on a little playground jungle gym and you're jumping down to the beach and you swim out, you know, 50 meters and turn around and swim back. And then you're doing push-ups, air squats, you know, sit-ups, whatever, whatever's part of the workout. And, at the end of it, everybody's smiling and laughing and yeah. All right, let's go, let's go have lunch together. And, and we're all hanging out and it's all the same talk. And yeah. yeah. You, you know what I like about it too, is it's, it's a, it's a great equalizer because you know, you, you, you go in there and okay, the weightlifting is this today. You're going to be good at that. But then this guy over here is probably going to kick your ass in the, you know, the Metcon, you know? So <laughs> it, it is, it's a great equalizer because everybody's, yeah. There's not one guy that is great at everything. Everybody's, you know, good at, you know, different things. And it's just, it, everybody's equalized. That's, yeah. that's what I love about it. Yep. Totally. Yep. Scott, this has been an awesome conversation. I cannot thank you enough for coming on, uh, just sharing the stories and words of wisdom, your little knowledge. I, I loved it, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I had a great time. Great time, yeah. my friend. Um, 
I will be back in Mass soon. And when I get there, if I can come down to the Cape, I'm going to make that happen. Heck, I'll come get a workout with you. Come on. Come on, baby. <laughs> hey, if you if you come up to watch you sit area, let me know because we'll go skiing too. Oh, I'd love, I, have, I talked about going up there. I didn't know, realize you were that close. Oh, yeah. Like, I can see the mountain from my house. Well, sort of. You want to drive a couple of roads and boom, you can see the mountain. But, mountain. All right. So for those of us on the east coast of the U.S., it's a mountain. Everybody on the west coast, yes, I know. It's a tiny hill. Back off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude, I'll give you a call when I get down there, Scott. I appreciate this, man. Appreciate it. All right, brother. I'll talk to you later. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Go. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page, at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember... When that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.